We now have the pleasure to hear from uh, professors Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, recipients of the Canada Gairdner International Award for development of CAS, CRISPR-Cas as a genome editing tool for eukaryotic cells. Their research on CRISPR-Cas9 mediated bacterial immunity has led to efficient genome edit engineering in animals and plants, creating a transformative technology that is revolutionizing the fields of genetics, microbiology, medicine, and many others. Professor Doudna is the Li Ka Shing Chancellor's Chair in Biomedical and Health Sciences, and she is Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology and Professor of Chemistry at University of California at Berkeley. She's an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She's a member of the National Academy of Science, the Ac American Academy of Arts and Science, the National Academy of Medicine, and the National Academy of Inventors, the American Association for the Academy of Science and the American Society of Microbiology. She is a founder and the executive director of the Innovative Geno Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley and UC uh, San Francisco. Professor Charpentier is a scientific member of the Max Planck Society and director at the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in Berlin, Germany. She is an Alexander von Humboldt professor in Germany and visiting professor at Umeå University in Sweden. She is also co-founder of CRISPR Therapeutics and ERS Genomics, created to the facilitation of the development of the CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering technology for biotechnological and bi uh, biomedical purposes. She is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences the German National Academy of Sciences, the European Academy of Microbiology, the Academy, American Academy of Microbiology, and elected uh, EMBO member. We'll first hear from Professor Doudna, followed directly by Professor Charpentier. So please welcome our, our, our speakers to the stage. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you for that generous introduction. And I'd like to start by thanking the Gardner Foundation and uh, board members, as well as my husband, Jamie Kate, my, uh, many of my colleagues, and uh, lab members who are here today to uh, celebrate this really exciting science and to hear from all of us who have been working in this field. I think we heard a great talk this morning from Rodolphe and Philippe that explained the origins of the CRISPR field from the perspective of microbiology and food science. And what I'd like to do now is to tell you about uh, work that I've been involved with over the last decade or so to investigate from a molecular perspective the way that bacteria fight viral infection and how that turned uh, our attention to the potential use of this and, and its import as a genome editing technology. So I wanted to start by uh, pointing out that ever since the discovery of the structure of DNA back in the 1950s, scientists have been thinking about how one might be able to manipulate the genetic code inside of cells and, and really sort of asking ourselves this question, what if it were possible to make a very precise change to the DNA of a cell, very much the way that we think about editing the text of a document. And until recently, that seemed, that idea seemed very much like science fiction. But uh, what you're hearing about in this symposium is about a technology that really enables that kind of precise rewriting of the genetic code in cells and organisms. And, um, and the amazing thing about this is that it's a technology that came about not from a targeted effort to discover a genome editing tool, but actually from a, cur a curiosity-driven project that was targeted at uh, something seemingly very different, namely understanding how bacteria fight viral infection. And this is a slide that just shows that uh, when viruses land on the surface of a bacterium, they begin injecting their genetic material, and at that point in time, bacteria have just a few minutes to come up with a defense against these viruses before they face uh, cell death. And so that's a very strong selective pressure for different ways that bacteria can uh, fight off these pathogens. 
So I wanted to show uh, this slide here that just illustrates that um, when, a, when a virus infects a cell, whether it's a human cell, a bacterial cell, or anything else, um, that infection begins with injection of genetic material. And the CRISPR uh, pathways are really uh, pathways in bacteria that have evolved to detect this foreign genetic material that gets injected into the cell. And uh, as you'll see, and as you heard in, in the first uh, uh, lectures, it use that genetic material as a defense against future infection. So the CRISPR pathways came to my attention back in 2005 with the work of Jill Banfield, who was mentioned in the first talk. She's a, a, a really a, a fantastic uh, researcher who works in a very different field from my own, namely studying the metagenomics of microbes. And uh, she called me one day in my office at UC Berkeley, uh, right uh, around uh, the middle of the 2000s, when three publications had appeared in the, in the microbiology literature that showed that, uh, that reported that many bacteria have repetitive elements in their genomes, uh, shown here, called CRISPRs that you heard about in Rodolphe and Philippe's talk, that are characterized by a series of short repeats, about 40 base pairs in length, that occur over and over and, are, and flank unique sequences that are derived from viruses or plasmids, in other words, foreign DNA elements that get into the cell shown here in these colored boxes. And these three publications in 2005 reported that these unique sequences, in many cases, are derived from the very viruses that infect these bacteria. And so this was one of the first important clues in the literature that uh, these systems were, that, that these, uh, these sequences were somehow signatures of a bacterial immune system. And what was particularly uh, suggestive about the operation of these sequences as a pathway was the fact that nearby in the genome were CRISPR-associated or Cas genes encoding proteins that were predicted to be somehow involved in this sort of a pathway. And at the time, this was strictly a hypothesis. Nobody knew how this might actually work from a mechanistic perspective. So uh, let me show you a short video that uh, just sort of summarizes this, uh, the, the way this immune system works and uh, how it was harnessed as a technology. And then I'm going to uh, dive back into a few of the uh, details in terms of what my own lab has been working on to try to understand how this works and how we can uh, help it to be employed in the future to solve human health problems and um, problems in agriculture and other fields. Oh, my, my sound isn't playing here. Oh, dear. Well, I'll, I'll narrate it for you. So, so this is basically showing you a bacterium that's uh, being injected with a virus. And um, here is the CRISPR locus in the genome. And when exposed to a virus, a new segment of DNA can be integrated into the CRISPR locus, such that it's flanked by copies of these repeat elements. And then, um, importantly, a copy yes. of this. And the RKH chopped into functional units. <laughs> <laughs> one viral sequence plus the flanking repeat. The chopping process requires a separate RNA called tracer RNA that together bind to the Cas9 protein, a component of CRISPR immunity, to form a surveillance complex. In the laboratory, the functional parts of the two RNAs can be combined into a single guide RNA that holds onto Cas9 and programs it to find and cut a desired DNA sequence. Upon finding DNA with a matching sequence, the Cas9 RNA machine holds onto the matching DNA sequence, unwinds it, and cuts each strand of the DNA double helix. In bacteria, the broken viral DNA is chopped up and destroyed by other proteins, thereby halting the infection. But in animal and plant cells, this kind of RNA program cutting triggers cells to repair the broken DNA by making small changes at the site of the break. In this way, a bacterial immune system was harnessed as a powerful technology for site-specific genome editing. So, I think for me, one of the amazing things about all of this has been the fact that uh, for the work that I did with my colleague Emmanuel Charpentier, our interest began 
with the fundamental biology of how these pathways operate. And over the years, um, in my own lab, we've actually been investigating the molecular basis for uh, these CRISPR systems from the perspective uh, of all of these sort of three steps of adaptive immunity, namely how cells uh, acquire new DNA sequences into the CRISPR locus, how those sequences are deployed in the form of RNA together with proteins that target foreign DNA elements, and then finally how that uh, interference step actually works, how the targeting and recognition and cleavage of DNA operates. And um, in, a, in a, a series of experiments that have been done by, by a number of labs, and you heard again about, uh, about some of this work in the first talk, we now know that cells that uh, have a CRISPR locus in the genome, this is a cartoon of a bacterial cell, and here's the circular chromosome with a CRISPR locus in it, transcription leads to production of an RNA molecule that includes copies of these repeat elements, which often have the ability to fold back into hairpin type structures at the RNA level, flanking these inserted sequences that come from viruses. And then, uh, in one of the things that we did early on in my lab was to understand this processing step, how RNAs are generated that, are, uh, that include just one copy of a viral sequence in each RNA, and then those RNAs assemble with one or more proteins encoded by the Cas genes to form protein RNA targeting complexes, and it's those uh, interference complexes that are capable of recognizing foreign nucleic acid through forming base pairs between the RNA in the, in the uh, surveillance complex and the target sequence. And it's that interaction that allows the Cas proteins to cleave the, the associated uh, DNA. And so what I want to focus on today is our work to understand, to answer this question right here, which is namely, how does RNA-guided DNA cleavage work? And really, I got involved in this because I've had a longstanding interest in the function of RNA in cells. And I just want to, want to take a step back for a moment to the, what we call the central dogma of molecular biology, which is that DNA is typically the genetic repository in cells uh, whose information is deployed through a process that involves transcription into RNA and then translation into proteins. But in my lab, I've always been interested in, uh, in uh, the, the uh, fact that a number of RNAs don't encode proteins, but they actually are functional on their own. They're functional in their own right as RNAs. And so we've been investigating the role of RNA in controlling expression and, and use of information in the genome in various ways. And so my own uh, fascination with CRISPR biology really came about through my discussions with Jill Banfield back in the mid-2000s and realizing that this could be a fascinating example of bacteria that had figured out how to use small RNAs to control gene expression, in this case, in the form of controlling viruses. And so it was through that line of, of research that I eventually teamed up with my colleague Emmanuel Charpentier and her students, and um, we were, we had a very specific goal in mind. We wanted to understand the molecular function of a protein called Cas9, encoded by the Cas gene, which had been genetically implicated in DNA, uh, in, in RNA-guided DNA cleavage. And at the time, nobody understood how that actually worked. And so in a, in a, a, a great international uh, collaboration across the ocean, uh, we had the, the good fortune to have two wonderful people in our labs, Christoph Chylinski in Emanuel's lab and Martin Janek in my lab, who teamed up to explore the function of Cas9. And what these guys figured out was that Cas9, which is shown here in this blue uh, cartoon, is an amazing enzyme that has the ability to bind and unwind DNA molecules at a sequence matching a 20 nucleotide stretch a sequence in a CRISPR RNA molecule, this molecule right here. And when that base pairing between the RNA and DNA occurs, DNA, uh, the DNA opens up inside the protein and allows the protein to generate a double-stranded break in the DNA at a precise place. And, um, and two things that emerged from our biochemical work on this system turned out to be extremely important for understanding its function and harnessing it as a technology. 
First of all, we figured out that in addition to the CRISPR RNA, a second RNA molecule is essential for the function of Cas9, and that's an RNA called tracer, shown here in red. Emmanuel's lab had shown previously that the tracer RNA is essential for RNA processing of CRISPR guide molecules, these molecules here, but we found out that it actually uh, maintains a structure with the end of the CRISPR RNA to form a handle for binding of the Cas9 protein, and it's that interaction that allows assembly of this functional protein RNA complex. And secondly, we found out that the role of this PAM sequence that you heard about in Rodolphe and Philippe's talk, which for this enzyme is a GG dinucleotide, is essential for DNA unwinding that allows this recognition and cleavage to work. And so when Martin Jenek figured out that, uh, that these were the minimal components of the system, as a, as a good biochemist, he began trimming away at these natural RNAs to figure out what, was the, what were the minimal elements required for DNA target recognition and cleavage. And that led to the idea that we could actually simplify the RNA uh, compared to what nature has done to create a single guide form of the transcript that would include the guide sequence on this end and the Cas9 binding element on the other end, thereby creating a simpler two-component system, a single protein, and a single RNA that would allow Cas9 to bind and cut DNA at essentially any desired sequence by simply changing the sequence element on this end of the single guide RNA. And to test that idea, Martin uh, did a, a very simple uh, experiment in the lab in which he took a plasmid uh, DNA and designed five different versions of a single guide RNA molecule that would recognize this DNA at sites simply chosen to be adjacent to a GG dinucleotide motif. And we picked either strand of the plasmid. And then uh, we incubated the Cas9 enzyme with one of these single guide RNAs, as well as a restriction enzyme, Sal1, that cuts about 60 base pairs upstream of this region in the plasmid. And this is an agarose gel that shows the DNA digestion products of those reactions. And I hope you can see that in each case, a little fragment of DNA was released in these, from these doubly digested plasmas that corresponded exactly in size to the size expected based on cutting by these single guide RNAs. And so this was really for us the moment when this project went from being a curiosity-driven experiment to the realization that this could be harnessed as an incredibly uh, powerful and exciting technology. So, uh, so the way that this, this uh, operates is that it, uh, we now understand, and this is a work that we did collaboratively with the lab of Eva Nogales at Berkeley, was we figured out that Cas9 is, a, is an amazing enzyme that starts off in a structure in which it's sort of uh, two structural lobes or domains are folded in on each other, but upon binding to a guide RNA, a channel opens up in the center of the protein where the RNA-DNA hybrid winds up when this actually associates with a substrate DNA molecule. And I have a, a 3D printed model here of um, that represents a crystallographic structure of Cas9 that shows in a little more detail how this actually works. So the protein is shown in white, holding on to its guide RNA in orange. And when this complex interacts with a DNA sequence that matches the sequence in the guide RNA, the DNA unwinds inside the protein and allows an RNA-DNA hybrid to form, the blue and orange helix here, displacing the other strand of the DNA and triggering a conformational change in the protein that puts the active sites in position to cut the DNA. And in a, a whole series of experiments that we've done uh, over the last three years in the lab using a combination of X-ray crystallography, electron microscopy, uh, uh, various kinds of fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and, um, and uh, live cell imaging, we now understand a lot about how this actually works. And I just want to show a movie that was made by an undergraduate student at Berkeley, Aubrey Thompson, that morphs together the different structural states of Cas9 to show you a remarkable conformational change that this protein undergoes upon DNA binding. So it starts off in a, sort of a closed state with the protein alone, and as this morphs to a structure bound to guide RNA, you saw a big rearrangement in the protein structure here that creates the channel in the center 
where the guide RNA part of this uh, orange guide molecule ends up. And then upon DNA binding, there's an additional rearrangement of the protein structure here to accommodate the RNA-DNA hybrid. And it's that final conformational uh, change that turns out to be critical to put Cas9 into a, a state in which it can actually cleave DNA. And this is a, a structural work that was done very recently in the lab, a, a, another a great collaboration with Ivan Ogalis, and using a combination of electron microscopy and crystallography, we could visualize this uh, double-stranded DNA opening up inside the protein and positioning the two places in the DNA for, uh, for cleavage by active sites, separate uh, active sites in the protein. So we understand very well how this molecular machine operates. And, um, uh, but let me explain how this actually works as a DNA editing uh, technology. So it turns out that in bacteria, as you heard from, from Rodolphe and Philippe, bacteria can deploy this kind of a system to cleave foreign DNA, leading to its degradation. So it's a great way to defend against viral infection. But in plant and animal uh, cells and other kinds of what we call eukaryotic cells, these cells have developed very uh, sufficient, uh, efficient and sophisticated methods for repairing double-stranded breaks in DNA. And this is a cartoon that just shows that uh, when a double-stranded break occurs in the genome of, uh, of uh, one of these types of cells, pathways for repairing these breaks have uh, developed that include something called non-homologous end joining that often introduces a small disruption in the DNA sequence at the site of repair, or in some cases, homologous recombination in which a donor DNA template can be recombined into the DNA during the process of repair. And that actually introduces new genetic information at the site of the break. And so many labs working over the last two or three decades have come to appreciate that you could harness these repair pathways in cells if you had a way of introducing a site-specific double-stranded break in a genome at a place where a, a, a change in the DNA sequence was desired. And so let me show you this uh, video made by Janet Awasa for us at the University of Utah uh, that illustrates how we imagine that this bacterial system actually operates for genome editing in eukaryotic cells. And so we're zooming into a, a eukaryotic cell, and of course in these types of cells, the DNA is inside the nucleus, and furthermore, it's packaged in the form of chromatin. So you can see the blue DNA wrapped around green uh, histone proteins. And um, this bacterial system, Cas9 with its guide RNA, has to search through all of the DNA in the genome to find, in principle, a single site that matches the sequence of the guide RNA. And when that interaction occurs, the, the, the protein forms the structure that I showed you before. The DNA unwinds and positions the, the two strands to be cleaved by Cas9. And then these broken ends of the DNA are handed off to the repair machinery in cells. And in this example, uh, you can see an integration of a new sequence of DNA at the site of the break. And so this uh, technology, I think, really came along at a point in time when it, uh, when it was really building on earlier methods of generating site-specific double-stranded breaks in DNA, so people understood how to do that, the challenge was how to do it simply and efficiently and easily, and I think that's really what the CRISPR-Cas9 system offers, is a tool that is, uh, has really democratized the ability to conduct genome editing in labs around the world. And so currently in our own lab, you know, we're, we're working on sort of three uh, three uh, aspects of this. One is to really figure out how to do tissue and cell type specific delivery of Cas9. And as biochemists, we're particularly excited about the opportunity to deliver Cas9 protein RNA complexes that are pre-assembled in the laboratory and have been chemically modified to be recognized by specific cell types. And that's, a, that's a, an idea that's led to a number of uh, clinical collaborations that we now have. And, um, and I'm very excited about the potential for this in the future. Secondly, uh, of course, we want to continue to understand the molecular basis for CRISPR adaptive immunity, not just the DNA recognition and cleavage step, but also the integration of new uh, DNA into genomes by 
the CRISPR integrase, and we've done uh, a lot of work on that, and that's ongoing. And then, uh, we, of course, we want to continue to understand and enhance gene editing methods um, that are coming out of uh, the, the, uh, the interesting diversity of CRISPR pathways and other non-CRISPR pathways that have evolved in microbes to defend against viruses as well, a very exciting uh, line of work that we're pursuing with Jill Banfield and, and others at Berkeley. So in the last uh, few minutes, I just want to turn to applications of this technology and to my own sort of personal journey in thinking about uh, how one goes from being a biochemist and a structural biologist studying uh, what I thought was a fascinating but somewhat obscure area of biology to suddenly finding ourselves involved in a technology that is truly transformative and really has important implications that, that extend into, into realms that I initially knew nothing about, like human embryo editing and the ethics of various kinds of applications of gene genome engineering. So, um, as you know, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology has been deployed in, in a wide range of, of organisms, including uh, plants and fungi and animals that are important in uh, agriculture and, and that we use as pets, and also for, uh, for uh, uh, cells and animals that are important for studying uh, and perhaps eventually treating human disease, including stem cells and uh, animals like monkeys and mice that are, that are used as models of human disease, and maybe in the not too distant future to actually think about how we might treat uh, patients that suffer from genetic disease. Now one thing I also want to point out is that over the last uh, four years or, or so, uh, certainly as, as people started adopting this technology, the other thing that's been very interesting and very exciting is that I fairly regularly receive in my email uh, notes from colleagues around the world who are using this to um, conduct their research in organisms that were previously genetically intractable. And here's a great example. This was a, a, a slide that was sent to me by Michael Perry and Cla Claude Desplan at, at the New York University in which they were able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to genetically modify the wing patterns of butterflies, a system that, uh, that, that was really hard to study previously genetically and now can be investigated in detail. So I think just to appreciate uh, the, the, uh, the pace of research, we have to also appreciate that this is really a technology that's opened doors to people that are working on all sorts of systems that go beyond the biomedical and, and agricultural. Um, so a couple of recent developments. So uh, first of all, there, there, uh, this was an uh, announcement that was made earlier in the summer about the first uh, clinical trial using CRISPR to treat cancer patients. And the idea here was to not try to, try to uh, gene edit the cancer cells directly, but actually to uh, try to edit the, the patient's immune cells so that they would attack uh, cancer more efficiently. And there now are, are, I think, four clinical trials that have been approved uh, for uh, the use of, of CRISPR in this sort of way. So I think that, you know, this is already uh, showing the incredible pace of the field in going from the advent of the technology to the first clinical trials within four years. Really uh, quite, a, quite amazing. And then, um, of course, the use in plants and for agriculture has also uh, been very exciting to watch. And this uh, article was published a few months ago in Nature magazine announcing the first uh, sort of product, CRISPR, in this case a CRISPR mushroom that was made using the CRISPR technology to make a knockout of a single gene in the mushroom that prevents these mushrooms from turning brown when they're cut. And the reason this made the news in Nature was that uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture decided that they would not regulate this product because it contains no foreign DNA. So in the United States, this is not considered a genetically modified organism. And so uh, this, is, this has triggered a lot of discussion uh, globally. I've been involved in a number of international uh, conversations about this and is really, I think, uh, making all of us examine, you know, what, do we, what, what, what does it mean to genetically modify something and uh, how do we think about regulating those products? And finally, I just want to end by, by pointing out that, you know, uh, early on with this technology, it was clear that it was powerful and, and uh, uh, very effective in a wide range of different types of cells and organisms, including in embryos. And this, was a, this is actually a slide that my colleague uh, Russell Vance uh, sent to me in early 2013 when he was beginning to use the CRISPR-Cas uh, tools that, uh, with vectors that, that we gave him from the lab to do germline editing in mice. And so this is just showing a, showing a pipette that's holding on to a fertilized egg with a needle coming in and injecting 
the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, molecules into this, uh, into this fertilized egg. And, um, and the outcome of that experiment in Russell's lab was actually this, uh, this result right here, namely that they had been able to inject uh, these mice embryos and then uh, implant them into a, into a uh, female mouse who gave birth to these pups. And what you can see here is that six of the pups uh, had the, these uh, animals developed from embryos that were edited using a guide RNA for Cas9 that targeted a single gene important for development of the black coat color. And you can see that those six animals are all white, uh, whereas their litter mates that were not uh, targeted with this technology are black. And so it just shows you the, the, the power of this. These animals were otherwise normal. And, um, and then in early 2014, this same kind of experiment was done in monkeys to make uh, genetically modified monkeys. And the thing about doing germline editing is that this means that the changes that are made to the DNA are occurring in all of the cells of the animal and can be transmitted to future generations. And I think it was really this experiment that started, uh, that sort of set me on the path of thinking about the importance of explaining this technology to, uh, to the broader uh, public, uh, people who are outside of science who didn't certainly at the time appreciate the, the power of this and, and the pace of the science that it had enabled. Um, but also to really think about the potential for this to be used not only in monkeys, but also in humans. And this was actually the, the picture on the cover of that Economist uh, magazine under the title Editing Humanity, in which uh, you know, I think people have really been captivated by the potential to use this in the human germline for editing that would uh, you know, span the range from correcting a defect that causes genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease, for example, but, uh, but uh, expanding to potentially the ability to um, alter other kinds of, 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 of features of humans as well. And, and should we go there? Is this something that we want to do? And so that I've been very engaged with colleagues, many of them here, thinking about this and, and uh, uh, convening an international meeting last, uh, last year that led to a, a series of reports that are coming out now and uh, uh, future meetings that are planned to continue this global conversation and invite scientists to engage with each other and think about how we can move forward in a responsible way with this powerful technology. So I'd like to close by acknowledging a wonderful group of people uh, for me, science is always about collaboration. It's always about working with colleagues, and I've had the incredible uh, pleasure to, to know uh, the folks here, my fellow recipients of the Gardner Award, and, that, and work that we've all uh, been involved with in this field over the years. Um, these are the students in the lab currently, the a picture taken at a recent uh, Giants uh, baseball game. And, uh, and then we've also had the great fortune to work with a variety of collaborators. And I, didn't list them all here. It would probably take uh, more than a page, but, but I certainly want to point out Emmanuel and Christoph, who worked with us initially on the Cas9 project, uh, Gino and his postdoc David Nellis at UC San Diego, who are working very actively on harnessing the CRISPR system for imaging of molecules in living cells. And then uh, Evan Ogales, Jamie Kate, and sorry, off the bottom of the slide here, Robert Tejan, all at UC Berkeley, who are current uh, very active collaborators on different aspects of understanding mechanisms and applications of the CRISPR technology. So I'll close there, and I just want to uh, put up my uh, company connections and thank you for your attention. <laughs>